Welcome back. In this segment, we will continue to focus on political speech. In the previous segment, we've defined it and we've highlighted the protection of political debates. In this segment, we will focus on the implication of this protection for public and political officials. Indeed, if the right to political expression is the object of enhanced protection, this means that political officials themselves can be the object of greater, possibly even offensive, criticism than the average citizen. That may also be hard to believe because people seem to be more readily imprisoned for criticizing the action of government officials, monarch or public officials, than for criticizing their next door neighbors. Indeed, there are countries in the world where criticizing your official is bound to take you to prison. Let me give you one example which has been making the headlines uh, in 2016. Turkey and its president Erdogan has engaged in multiple lawsuits for insult to the president. And that exemplifies the inability of the powerful to tolerate and accept criticism and attacks as part and parcel of their role. Indeed, President Erdogan has adopted an octopus-like behavior when it comes to criticism, extending his reach of intolerance to criticism far beyond the border of Turkey. For instance, in Germany, a comedian is being sued under some obscure German provision for insult to a foreign dignitary. Such charges and the sentence that may be imposed upon those daring to criticize a political elite violate well-established international norms regarding political expression and criticism of elected or public officials. Indeed, around the world, for close to 50 years now, international, regional and a large number of national courts have insisted that the limits of acceptable criticism are wider when they concern a politician, elected officials or public officials, than when they concern a private individual. In circumstances of public debate concerning public figures in the political domain and public institution, the value placed on uninhibited expression is indeed very high. Why is it so? Primarily for the reasons we have highlighted before, to protect public debates for the interest of open discussion of political issues. Secondly, because unlike a private citizen, politicians inevitably and knowingly open themselves to close scrutiny of their words and of their actions by journalists and the public at large. And they must consequently display a greater degree of tolerance to criticism or indeed thick skin. Now, what do we mean by political official, public officials? How far does that go? Basically, these are persons empowered with significant responsibility and discretion in managing public affairs, whether at state level, whether at a local level or community level. They may be elected, they may be appointed. They may be candidate for such position or they may be the actual post holder. They include government officials, state officials, but also monarchs, kings, princes and queens. The UN Human Rights Committee insists that all public figures, including those exercising the highest political authority, such as heads of state and governments, are legitimately subject to criticism and political opposition. Okay. So what does that mean in practice? Because as we have highlighted earlier, the situation in many countries around the world tend to indicate that public officials do not like being criticized. So in theory, and indeed in the practice of a large number of countries, what it means is that public officials, elected officials, political leaders should tolerate greater scrutiny on their actions and greater criticism of their action than a normal citizen. And in turn, if they don't accept it, the court should remind them that such enhanced scrutiny and criticisms are necessary to a democratic society and to public debate. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights, in the case of Herrera Uloa versus Costa Rica, has established that it is logical 
and appropriate that statement concerning public officials and other individuals who exercise functions of a public nature should be accorded a certain latitude in the broad debate on matters of political interest that is essential for the functioning of a truly democratic system. In Africa, in 2015, the African Court for Human Rights ruled that Burkina Faso violated Article 9 of the African Convention, that's the right to freedom of expression. The court in particular stated that freedom of expression in a democratic society must be the subject of a lesser degree of interference in the context of public debate relating to public figures. Consequently, I'm still quoting the court, people who assume highly visible public role must necessarily face a higher degree of criticism than private citizens. Otherwise, public debate may be stifled altogether. So let's illustrate by some more examples how far this criticism may go. First of all, the level of protection afforded to criticism of political figures may translate into a different legal test and reasoning. One of the most important and older decisions concerning public officials and freedom of expression dates back to the struggle for civil rights in the United States. It's about an advertisement in the New York Times which accused the police commissioner of Montgomery, Alabama of police brutality in its handling of civil rights protesters. A lower level court had attributed damages to the police commissioner, but the case went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And the court there recognized, as the previous one had done, that some of the statements in the advertisement were either false or at the very least misleading. However, it agreed to examine the defamation claim brought by the police commissioner against what it characterized, and I'm going to quote them here, as the profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issue should be uninhibited robust and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attack on government and public official. On that basis, the US Supreme Court ruled that the public interest in protecting that form of speech greatly outweighed an occasional erroneous statement about a public official. That's a very important uh, determination. Further, the court also held that the standard that must be applied by courts when publication makes statement about public or government official is not merely to determine whether or not the statement is false. Instead, the public official claiming defamation must prove that the publication set forth the statement with, and I quote, actual malice, uh, putting there a new concept to you maybe, actual malice. What does this mean? It refers to a mental state at the time a statement is made. Was this statement made with the knowledge that it was false or in reckless disregard as to whether it was true or false? It's a very important standard one that, that has been the object of uh, a number of um, court cases. And it basically means that when it comes to political expression concerning uh, public officials, defamation claim must be assessed on a different basis than when the expression concerns somebody else. The actual malice standard applies in the United States to public figures and to public officials. As a higher test for defamation, it is meant to ensure that defamation cannot be used to silence public criticism. That reasoning has been influential in other countries besides the United States, in England, India, South Africa, the Philippines, and many others, where the actual malice test is often used with reference to criticism of public officials. 
International Human Rights Court have also stressed in their ruling that criticism of political and public officials may go as far as including offensive statement that the action of public and government officials can be the object of close scrutiny and that criticism of government should not be the object of prohibition. Let me highlight that from a, a case in uh, the European Court, Lingens versus Australia. It's an older case, but still uh, eminently uh, relevant now. In October 1975, shortly after the Austrian general election, an Austrian journalist, Mr. Lingens, published two articles relating the activities of the 1st SS Infantry Brigade during the Second World War. The article also focused on Mr. Friedrich Peter, the president of the Austrian Liberal Party who had served in that SS Brigade. And the article focused as well on his role in criminal proceedings instituted in grants at the time uh, when the, um, at the end of the war. The journalist in those articles also criticized Bruno Kreisky, the retiring chancellor and president of the Austrian Socialist Party, accusing him of protecting the head of the Austrian Liberal Party and other members of the SS for political reasons. In his article, the journalist used such expression as basest opportunism, immoral and undignified. The retiring chancellor instituted private proceedings for defamation and the Vienna Regional Court holding that the retiring chancellor had been criticized in his private capacity fined the applicant 20,000 shillings. On appeal, the fine to the journalist was reduced to 15,000 shillings. The case eventually reached the European Court for Human Rights in 1982 and the court ruled against Austria and in favor of the journalist. And it argued the following four things. First, freedom of political debate is at the very core of the concept of a democratic society. Second, the limits of accepting criticism are accordingly wider as regard a politician than as regard a private individual. Thirdly, Mr. Lingen's article dealt with political issues of public interest in Austria, which had given rise to many heated discussions concerning the attitude of Austrians in general to the participation of former Nazis in the governance of their country. Fourthly, the expression used in the article, including basest opportunism, immoral and undignified, are to be seen against the background of a post-election political controversy. These expressions were in no way unusual in the art for tussles of politics. So what the court there argued is that criticism of public officials can go as far as being expressed in offensive terms, and this ought to be okay under international human rights law. Indeed, courts have consistently emphasized that a politician inevitably and knowingly lays himself open to close scrutiny of his or her every word and deed by both journalists and the public at large, and he or she must consequently display a greater degree of tolerance. You find that commitment on the part of the court in many parts of, of the world. Members of parliament, local politicians, government, public authorities, all public figures in general have to accept even sharp criticism, sometimes expressed in a harsh or hostile tone. The European Court has also insisted that pluralism in a democratic society demands protection of not only statements that are favorable and inoffensive, but as well as those that offend, shock, or disturb. And that applies particularly to the political sphere. So in one case related to Turkey, the European Court found that even biased and offensive political speech that fell short of incitement to violence was within the realm of political speech. 
and thus its restrictions cannot meet the necessity requirement. The criticism may even concern a politician's private life. The European Court again has stated that political invective often spills over into the personal sphere. Such are the hazards of politics and the free debate of ideals, which are the guarantees of a democratic society. So basically what the European Court is arguing here is that the notion of private sphere, as far as um, a politician is concerned, is very different from that which should accompany any normal citizen. The high level of protection for political expression also means that the limits of permissible criticism are wider with regard to a government. In a democratic system, the actions or omissions of the government, and by government I mean an institution, must be subject to the close scrutiny, not only of the legislative and judicial authorities, but also of the press and public opinions. So what courts around the world have argued is that it's not only individual public officials or politicians that should be open to larger criticism. It's also the institution they belong to. Practically, it means that there should be no laws prohibiting insult or defamation to the state or other abstract concept, such as national symbols, national identity, school of thought, religion, ideology, or political doctrine. Uh, we will return to these issues later uh, in the course, but let me highlight here uh, what it means in the context of political expression. In 1999, the UN Human Rights Committee, as it was reviewing the record of Mexico's, deplored the existence of the offense of defamation of the state, and it called for the abolishment of the crime. As the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression also stated, laws punishing defamation of the state or its institution conflict with the belief that freedom of expression and opinions is a touchstone of all the freedoms to which the United Nations is consecrated and one of the soundest guarantees of modern democracy. What it means is that people should be free to criticize the state, to attack the state in their words and expression and that states and other uh, institutions cannot be the object of defamation. It is pretty much the norms in many countries around the world, but it's also unfortunately violated in a few others where public institutions are protected against any form of institutions. And in those countries, this is one of the uh, biggest impediment to political expression. In conclusion, the last two segments have focused on the protection of political expression. Such enhanced protection constitutes a global norms by virtue of the international standard that support it, the large number of rulings by legitimate courts around the world, and by a range of normative and common sense argument as to why political expression must be protected. Such a right, such a form of expression is of course not always protected and the lack of protection goes hand in hand with other forms of violations around the world, including unfair election, one-party system, discrimination, and so on. But the last 50 years have seen remarkable progress toward the recognition of the principle of one person, one vote, and the protection of political expression. From Eastern Europe to Africa to Latin America, political expression has been the object of enhanced protection over the last 50 years and particularly uh, since the late 1980s. Indeed, there has been a radical transformation of the global political landscape. And this is a transformation that we need to highlight at a time when so many uh, governments attack the uh, right to freedom of expression and political expression.